We're going to be reading all of Genesis chapter 15. It will be on the screen as well, but it might be a different translation um, because I like to read from the NLT because it's it's a little smoother. So follow along with me. If we guys can stand too as we read scripture, that would be awesome. This is uh, Genesis chapter 15. Sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you and your and reward and your reward will be great. But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Since he's given me no children, Eliezer of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit all my wealth. You've given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. Then the Lord said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Then the Lord told him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land as your possession. But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, how can I be sure that I will actually possess it? The Lord told him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So Abram presented all these to him and killed them. Then he cut each animal down in the middle and laid the halves side by side. He did not, however, cut the birds in half. Some vultures swooped down to eat the carcasses, but Abram chased them away. As the sun was going down, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and and a terrifying darkness came down over him. Then the Lord said to him, Abram, you can be sure that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land where they will be oppressed as slaves for 400 years. But I will punish the nation that enslaves them. And in the end, they will come away with great wealth. As for you, you will die in peace and be buried in a ripe old age. After four generations, the descendants will return here to this land for the sins of the Amorites do not yet warrant their destruction. After the sun went down, the darkness fell. Abram saw a smoking fire port and a flaming torch that passed between the halves of the carcasses. So the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day and said, I have given you this land of your descendants all the way from border, the border of Egypt to the great Euphrates River, the land now occupied by the Kenites, Kenizzites, Kamand. Kadamites, Hittites, Prezites, Raphites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jezebites. So there's our patches this morning. Let's pray together as Joseph makes his way up. Father God, we ask that you would just open our hearts and our ears and our eyes so that me, we can hear your words, we can see you work in us, Father, and be open to the ways that we need to respond and be challenged through today's scripture passage and the words that you've placed on Joseph's heart, Father. So help us just to approach this time with openness and just see what you do in us. We love you and pray this in your son's name. Amen. Seated. So between the end of the series that we just finished on spiritual gifts and the Holy Spirit, and before we do a couple unity services um, with Awakening to wrap up this year on December 24th and 31st and launch a new series in January, we are doing a three-week mini-series that we're titling Expectations. Do we have the um, visual for that, guys? Um, I don't know if you guys know this. Zach can do like everything. (laughs) Um, So Zach put together this. Ask Zach what this means. Okay, he's the the theology history church guy. So talk to Zach after service uh, and ask him ask him about the the artwork. But we're doing this three-week series that we're titling Expectations. Today we're looking at an Old Testament passage. Next week we'll be looking at some of the prophets, and then Zach's going to teach on the 17th um, uh, uh, about what the disciples expected from the New Testament. And really as we're in this season of Advent, anticipation, um, we thought we would kind of step out of maybe the norm, although we want to keep some of this tradition with Advent and the lighting of the candles, and just kind of ask this question, what do we expect of God? And what do we get from God? 
And so as Castro read through Genesis 15, I'm sure some of you are like, this is weird. <laughs> the animals and the cutting in the half and the you know, fire pot and the smoke and all of that. So this, this honestly, I think might be one of the foundational texts in Genesis that really lays this understanding for us about who God is and really leads us to the New Testament and God's Son, all of that. So many years ago, after feeling disappointment over something that I can't remember, nor is it really important for the purpose of today, Haley told me something like this. My mom always says, she didn't say like, my mom always, she just said, my mama always says, disappointment is always preceded by expectations. Disappointment is always preceded by expectations, meaning when we find ourselves in a place of feeling disappointed, it's always because we had this expectation that wasn't met. And so we, we end up feeling disappointed. And, and sometimes misguided expectations do this. They lead to extreme disappointment. But other times, misguided expectations reveal to us a beautiful truth that honestly is so much better than what we had originally expected. And I think that's what we're going to find out today from Genesis chapter 15. Abram had expectations. This expectation, this understanding of what it meant to be in relationship with God, what it meant to expect from God, and those expectations were really different than reality, but it was so much better than what Abram expected. And so here we enter Genesis 15, and here's the expectation. Abram believed <clears throat> that in order for him to be in a covenantal relationship with God, he must have something to offer. That's what, that's what we see here, and I'm going to unpack that here in just a second. But, but he believed in order for me to be in a covenantal relationship with God, I must bring something to the table. But the reality is God needs nothing from us, and he always fulfills his promise as part of his covenantal relationship with his people. Put a bit more bluntly, and maybe in plain English, we often believe that we either owe God something or we have to earn what he has already given and promised to us. I think a lot of us approach life in this way. I owe God something. I have to earn what he's already given us. And so, friends, if you leave here today with one thing, I hope it's this. <clears throat> there is nothing that you can do for God nor give to God that will result in an increase in his faithfulness to fulfill his promises. Let me read that one more time. There is nothing that you can do for God nor give to God that will result in an increase in his faithfulness to fulfill his promises. And yet, we live our lives as if we owe God something. We live our lives, many of us, as if it's up to us to earn it. So let's take a look at Genesis 15 and see what I mean by this. In verse 1, we read, after all these things. Now, these things, it's important to kind of understand what brought us to this point here. In Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abram, and we read this just in the verse, first three verses of Genesis 12. Now, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And to him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in all in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God calls Abraham in verse 13. Abram and Lot separate. In verse 14, Abram essentially rescues Lot, but then he, he faces this kind of pressure from the king of Sodom. But ultimately, what we see at the very end of chapter 14 of Genesis is that Abram confirms his allegiance to God. He, he, he confirms the God, 
of the Old Testament is the God that he puts his faith in and his allegiance in. And so after all of these things, after Abram had just confirmed his allegiance to God, the Lord came to Abram in a vision and said, fear not, fear not. Now, why would the Lord need to say in a vision to Abram, fear not? Because Abram just saw the Lord in a vision. I mean, that would be enough to probably terrify some of us. A vision of the Lord communicating directly to you and the Lord says, don't be afraid for I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But then we see Abram's responses in verse two and three. He says this, but Abram said, oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, behold, you have given me no offspring and a member of my household will be my heir. O oh Lord, what will you give me? You see, in a, in a culture, in a context where blessing comes through children, primarily sons who carry on the family tradition, who carry on the inheritance, this is a question of doubt. <clears throat> a question where Abram responds to the Lord in a vision and says, how do I know? How do I know? You've given me no children. I see no way that you're going to bless me, and so I suppose it's going to need to be one of the servants of my household. How many of us struggle consistently with questions of doubt? Maybe we don't doubt God in terms of his existence, but we certainly doubt his faithfulness based on what we think he has promised to us. Like Abraham here, God, how will you bless me? I have no son. And, and so we take what we believe God has promised us, what we believe he owes us, and we doubt, God, will you be faithful? Will you fulfill what you have promised? And in reality, we might not ever state that we expect specific things from God, but then why do we get so discouraged when we don't get what we want or what we think God owes us? And when we feel that way, we have to come back to what I said in the beginning. Disappointment is always preceded by expectations. So we find ourselves feeling discouraged because we had confidence that God would do one thing and it doesn't seem to pass. And so God, so Abram asks God, how is this going to happen? What will you give me? I remain childless. Verses four and five, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man, speaking of Eliezer, shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven, number the stars, if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. These are God's promise to Abram. God will indeed fulfill the very thing that Abram just five seconds before thought he would not fulfill. Now, the challenge here is that it would be poor theology to make a claim that God always blesses us in the way that we hope for or that we anticipate based on an understanding of who he is. But in this context, we go back to chapter 12. God promises Abram that he will bless the world through him. And, and here in Abram's doubt and confusion, he says, I don't get it, God. I don't have a son. He actually says, you have given me no offspring. As if, God, this is your fault because you're not doing what needs to be done to make me a blessing to this world. And yet we see here, God again fulfilling his promise. Brings him outside, look to the heaven, number the stars, if you're able. Of course he's not able. <laughs> Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And in verse six, he believed the Lord, Abram believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. One scholar wrote, the Hebrew construction 
translated believe means to place trust in someone with confidence. The general idea is reliance. And the orientation of the person's trust is in the future. The text emphasizes that Abram entrusted his future to what God would do for him as opposed to what he could do for himself to obtain the promises. And so we see here, Abram trusted God. He believed the Lord, and the Lord counted it to him as righteousness. So here's what's happening. Abram doesn't believe the Lord because all of a sudden God provides the promise in front of him. That's when most of us believe the Lord. (laughs) Show me, and I'll believe it. Prove it, and I'll put my faith and my trust. But the wording here, scholars are very clear that that Abram's confidence and trust has nothing to do with the moment that he found himself in. The way that the verbs are translated here, the way that that the, the author wrote these words, it's very clear that what Abram is trusting is in the future. He's trusting what is to come with no proof in the moment other than God's promise other than God's promise. And so in verse 7, God responds to Abram, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land and to possess. Here, God is simply reminding Abram, I can do what I promised you. I've done it before and I can do it again. And so what we see here in these first seven verses is God appearing to Abram in a vision, fear not, I will bless you. Abram responding in a question of doubt to God, saying, how do I know? How do I know? Because you haven't done it so far, at least not in the way that Abram culturally would think about it, because you have not given me a son. So I suppose the way that you're going to bless me is not through a a member, a biological member of my family, but through a member of the household, which would have felt culturally like a loss, like a loss. God responds by saying, Abram, remember what I've done for you in the past. Remember. Try to count the stars. You count. You can't. But, but in that way, so shall your offspring be. So then we come to verse 8, and this is where the story begins to start getting a little bit interesting, honestly, a little weird to us with a 21st century Western cultural lens. But he said, speaking of Abram, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? So the doubt that Abram had, which came from his expectations, shifts a little bit here from doubt directed at God, how do I know God, to honestly doubt directed at himself and his ability to carry out the promises of God. How am I to know that I shall possess it? Okay, believing you is one thing. We've already seen that Abram believed the Lord. He counted it to him as righteousness. God would not have counted it as righteousness to Abram had he not actually believed. And so we see here this doubt shifting away from God and toward himself. How am I to know that I shall possess it? In other words, how am I to know that I can actually do this and that I'm the one that you're going to choose to bless the nations? Now, this kind of doubt is also pertinent to us, and for some of us, maybe even more than doubting God. For some of us, the root of this doubt is an issue of extreme lack of self-confidence or self-worth. When God says, I desire you, son, daughter, to be part of building up my kingdom, we find ourselves saying, well, I'm not, it's not good enough. 
I don't have this or that. I can't do this or that. I'm not very smart. I'm not good with my words. I'm not, the, the list goes on. And so we begin to then say, God, as part of your church, who you desire to, it's just not me. It's just not me. How am I going to do anything for your glory? For some of us, the root of this doubt is the result of fear of failure. It's why most of us rarely directly share our faith or our belief in the gospel of Jesus. Because we live in a culture, in a context, in a geographic area where approximately two and a half or three percent of people have put their faith in Jesus Christ. And so we think they're not going to respond. No way. I'm going to walk away feeling like a complete idiot and failure, so it's better to just keep my mouth shut, protect myself. I can't do it. I can't do it, so I'm not going to speak. For some of us, the root of this doubt is a lack of understanding of God's sovereignty and the power of His Holy Spirit. Look, we, we in some ways, kind of bring something to the table because God has called us to something, but ultimately, building up God's kingdom, salvation of, of a neighbor, of a coworker, the, it's not up to you. It's not up to you. And yet for others of us, the root of this self-doubt is actually just laziness or complacency. I'm just not going to be the one that God uses to bless so-and-so, to serve so-and-so, to contribute to the building up of the kingdom. Honestly, I just don't really want to do the work. So much more comfortable to sit on the couch, watch TV, turn on the game, more comfortable to spend hours and hours on social media, on your phone, where we can have pretend relationships than it is to respond to what God has called and promised us to. Brothers and sisters, I want to acknowledge that self-doubt and what God has called us to is normal. It's normal. However, Doubting ourselves in relationship to what God has called us to is downright dangerous, damaging to the church and God's kingdom, and quite honestly puts all of us at risk of a fatal ending for something that God desires to flourish. I read this to several people this week, and I asked, is this too much? <laughs> several of my brothers and sisters said, no, read it. So let me read it again. However, doubting ourselves but specifically in relationship to what God has called us to, is downright dangerous, damaging to the church and to God's kingdom, and quite honestly puts all of us at risk of a fatal ending for something that God desires to flourish. In other words, as God calls us, commands us, invites us into participating in the building up of His kingdom, each one of us invited into that, when we say, it's, I, I just don't have what it takes, like Abram, how will I know that I am the one to possess it? It's almost like turning to God and saying, I know you've called me to something. I think I might be a little bit smarter than you because I'm not sure if you're aware of this. I just can't do it. And God's saying, exactly, <laughs> exactly. You can't. You can't. But through me, Everything is possible. And so for us in the context of Trellis Church and the building up of God's kingdom, I get it. I mean, I spend time every week wondering, God, are you really going to do something? <laughs> or, why me? Choose, I mean, there's people a lot smarter and why me? And when I do that, I'm putting at risk the very thing that God has called me to build up. It's damaging to God's kingdom. So I was really convicted last night as I was finishing preparations for this after our community group, sitting on the couch just, okay, God, this is one of those sermons that you're having me preach to myself and hopefully others who are listening. Verse 9. He, speaking of God, said to him, Abram, Bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, 
and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on a carcass, Abram drove them away. Okay, for us in a 21st century Western context, we're like, somebody needs to call PETA and tell them what's happening because this is really strange. However, we have to understand Scripture is written in ancient Near East culture, a culture very, very different than us. Here's what is happening. We make contracts, agreements, covenants, typically through something in a written document that two people sign. Okay, so if, if you have been legally married, you have signed a document that says, I am committed to this marriage, and that is what legally honors your marriage. If you have ever purchased a piece of property, purchased a home, gone into a business relationship or a business agreement, we write things out that define, here's what this person's role and responsibility is, here's what this person's role and responsibility is, and we sign it. If we break the agreement of the contract, there are ramifications. That is what is happening here in ancient Near East culture, how agreements, contracts, covenants were made, uh, were exactly what Abram's doing here. You get animals, cut them in half. I know this sounds strange. This is real. You separate the animal halves, and then what happens is those two people, those two parties in agreement walk down the middle of these animal halves, and here's what is basically being stated. If I don't honor my commitment to this agreement, to this contract, to this covenant, may what has just happened to these animals happen to me. If I don't fulfill what I have committed might I be cut in half like these animals? What do you think the divorce rate would be today if, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's what's happening here. But here's the thing. God didn't have to tell Abram what to do. Let's look at this again, because this is interesting. He said to him, bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, a ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. God didn't say, and then here's what I need you to do. No, Abram just went and got him. He cut him in half. He laid each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in half. Abram knew what was about to happen. God was telling Abram, okay, how, how do you want to know that you should possess it? Well, let's create a contract. Let's make an agreement. Let's, let's create a covenant. So go and get me the animals. He didn't have to give instruction to Abram. Abram just knew what was happening. Abram knew what was happening. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Why? Abram was waiting for something. He's waiting for something. What was he waiting for? For God. He was going to make a contract, an agreement with God. So he's like, well, got to wait for somebody to show up. I'm not going to walk down this by myself. This is an agreement with God. And so he apparently waited long enough that birds are coming in, coming down on the carpacuses. Abram's driving them away. No, I, I, haven't, I haven't walked into this agreement yet. Then we see in verse 12, as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. The Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. As the sun was going down, a foreshadowing of about what was going to happen, a deep sleep fell on Abram. Uh, virtually every scholar who writes on this will say, God basically put Abram to sleep. Yes, it was nighttime, maybe about the time that Abram would fall asleep, but he was clearly busy um, getting the birds away from the carcasses. Abram was focused on something because of his expectation. And so a deep sleep fell on Abram. God essentially said, Abram, you're going to sleep here, brother. 
Then the Lord said, no for certain. Okay, this is God's response to what Abram asked back in verse 8. How am I to know that I shall possess it? Here is God's response. He's now responding to Abram's question. No for certain. I am making a promise to you. I am making a commitment to you. But notice what God says. He essentially says, first, things are going to be pretty bad. God doesn't always answer us in the way that we want him to answer. My job is to teach scripture, in part, not to tell you what you want to hear. But friends, talking to myself just as much as I'm talking to you today, God doesn't always answer us in the way that we want him to answer. Wouldn't it have made a better story if God would have just said, Go home, ask your wife, Sarah, she's pregnant. No, but that, that's not what God says here. He says, there's going to be hardship. There's going to be trouble. Your people are going to experience suffering. But in the end, I will fulfill my promises. Justice will come. You will return. Your people will return. And you're going to go to your fathers in peace, buried at a great old age. But for you to get what you want, it's not going to be easy. Suffering, trial, tribulation. And so friends, like Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteous, not because of what God did in that moment, but what God had promised him to come, we too must hold on the promises of what is to come. It's our only hope. It's our living hope. Because if we put our hope in today and tomorrow and next week, disappointment after disappointment after disappointment after disappointment, we must hold on to the long-term promises of God. So here's what happens in verse 17. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river of Euphrates, the land of all of those fun things. Why do you think I asked Casper to read the scripture today? Uh, I read chapter 15 and I was like, hey, why don't we do it differently this week? Okay, what we're reading here is what I believe to be one of the most significant passages in the entire Old Testament in terms of understanding God's love for us. Now, that's a pretty extreme statement, but I believe it to be true. Because here's what's happening. Abram fully expects and anticipates from what we can tell and from what most scholars would suggest, that he's going into a contract together, an agreement together with the Lord. How do I know I shall possess it? Well, I'm going to promise you, go get these animals. Abram's driving them off, waiting for the Lord's presence to come so that he can go into a contract and agreement with God. This is how I know, because we're going to pass down, in the midst of these two lines of animal halves, we're going to pass down together so that I know God will honor his commitment and Abram will honor his commitment, whatever God tells him that will be. This is not what happened. God passed down the middle by himself. Smoke and fire throughout the Old Testament is often symbolic and of, of God's presence. God puts Abram to sleep. While he's sleeping, the, the smoke and the fire pass down. And here's what God is saying. Our agreement, our covenant, the ability to fulfill the promises of, I will make you a great nation, that the people will be blessed because of you, has nothing to do with you. It is not dependent on you. You can work as hard as you want to honor the promise and the commitment and the agreement, and you will fail. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to put it all on me. Because I will honor the promise, I will honor the fulfillment, and I don't need you to commit or agree to anything. 
I'm holy, I'm sovereign, I'm powerful, I have all authority, and I can do this regardless of you. I don't need you to participate. What God did was completely unheard of. And when I really think about it, it's downright scandalous. Yes, you heard me correctly. I intentionally said scandalous. And I know some of us are going to like, nope, God's not scandalous. Here's the definition of scandalous straight from the dif- dictionary. A perceived offense against morality or law. A perceived offense against morality or law. And in the context that Abram found himself in, what God did was an outright offense. Why? How do you make an agreement with one person? Both need to contribute and commit to doing this in order for morality and ethics and all of that to exist. What was the law? Here's how agreements work. This is how we do things in ancient Near East culture. And God says, we're not going to do it that way. What you expect, what you think, what you believe about morality and ethics, what you believe about the way that things should be done in a, in a mutual relationship where both people are contributing equally and evenly, that's not how this covenant's going to work. He doesn't say this directly, but he's almost just saying, because you can't do it. You can't uphold a contract, an agreement, a covenant with God. Most of the rest of the Old Testament makes that very clear to us. Israel couldn't do it. God's grace redefines morality and it obliterates the law as we see it. That's why what happened here is scandalous because God redefines morality. He obliterates our expectations and the way that we see fairness according to the law. But friends, let's be honest. Some of us struggle to even agree with the theological position that there's literally nothing you can do to earn right standing with God, which is exactly why we must be saved by grace through faith, by grace and grace alone. Okay? We didn't just close our eyes and point at a couple songs this morning. We chose that song very intentionally. And you might not say that, but examine your life for a moment. Seriously. Take a moment to examine your life. Do you live as if you are completely and utterly dependent on God's initiative to enter into relationship with you apart from any action, effort, or promise that you bring to the table? Or do you spend your life trying to earn God's grace because deep down inside you feel like you have something to show him that it was worth it? I know for me, what I know to be true here often struggles to take root here. Because friends, I will tell you time and time again that I believe this statement that I just wrote, that I have nothing to bring to the table, that it's God's initiative why I can enter into relationship with him, and that apart from that, I don't really have anything to contribute or to bring. But man, some days and some weeks, I live my life as if I'm just going to show God it was worth it. I've got something to bring. I'm going to walk down that aisle with you, and I'm not even going to let you put me to sleep. I'm just going to stay here and hold my eyes open so so that I can show God, we're in this together. It's me too. I have something to bring. I have something to contribute. That's the beauty of grace through faith, that God does it, that God does it. So while the story in Genesis 15 is a story about Abram and God, It's a story that perfectly foreshadows what God ultimately did through his son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Here's what I mean. What would have happened had Abram suddenly awoke? 
realized what was happening. See the smire and the folk about the, the smoke and the fire about halfway down the aisle, for lack of better terms, and jumped up and said, I'm, I'm, I'm in this. Raced down to catch up with the smoke and the fire so that Abram and God would have been equals in this agreement. I'm not sure what would have immediately happened, but I can tell you what would have happened not long after because the rest of Scripture tells us what would happen. We would promise and we would fail. We would promise and we would fail. We would make commitments that we can never perfectly uphold because we are humans and God is God. But that's not what happened. Abram didn't wake up. He didn't race down with God. In fact, God not only walked down by himself, he also, on the cross, took the consequences that we so naturally deserve by our own wrongdoing, even though God was perfect. The Apostle Paul wrote it this way in Philippians 2. Let each of you look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was actually in the form of God, did not account did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. While Paul writes in the New Testament that we have been crucified with Christ, in that moment, we weren't on the cross. That wasn't an equal agreement. Okay, Jesus will be crucified as long as I'm up there with him. God took the initiative. Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 14, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Here's what Paul is saying here. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Here's what happens when we trust in Jesus and the good news of the gospel, and we trust grace alone, and we trust that this is God's initiative, and that we inherently bring nothing to the table. When we understand that, we, like Paul, say, I'm going to work harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. In other words, Paul's saying, Apart from the grace of God, this whole gospel thing and working hard for the sake of the gospel, it doesn't exist without God's grace. It can't exist because I know myself. <laughs> I know my character. I persecute the church, but by the grace of God. Friends, there is a significant difference between living out our faith in such a way that God graciously uses us to impact his kingdom and spending our entire lives trying to earn something that is literally impossible for us to earn. There's a difference there. On the outside, our actions might look the same, or at least sometimes they might look the same, but on the inside, our perspective is completely different. It's very different to say, I will spend my life earning the grace that comes through Jesus and saying, by the grace of God, through Jesus, I am able to pursue God's kingdom wholeheartedly. Does that make sense? Difference in that mindset, the perspective?
you know, some of us spend a lot of time saying something like, uh, I'm just going to serve God. I was listening to an interview with John Piper this week, and he said, remember what Jesus said? I came not to be served. We spend our whole lives. I serve God. I serve God. I serve the one who said, I didn't come to be served. It's an interesting thing to think about because it feels pretty confusing. The language makes sense. I'm going to spend my life serving God. I've said that probably a billion times. (laughs) I want to serve God. Well, the God that I'm serving said he didn't come to be served, but to serve. And so when that grace trickles down to us, it's less about I have to do this for God so that I might earn, so that I might prove, and much more about I get to participate in God's kingdom so out of grace and mercy that I do not deserve, and praise the Lord for that. Band, if you could make your way back up here. I want to spend a few minutes before we move into a time of communion and closing of worship, settling our hearts. I think pretty strongly, and this is a sense of mine, that Trellis Church has a lot of good Christians who fall into the same temptation that I fall into. That I've got to do it. I've got to earn it. I've got to prove to God. I've got to enter into the agreement with God the same way that Abram was expecting to enter into the agreement with God. And when we don't, we become discouraged, we become depressed, we become anxious. Why? Because we're actually thinking the wrong way. Because we're thinking the wrong way. So I want to spend a couple minutes before we move into communion and prayer just kind of settling our hearts. I think there's some of us here who probably need to just spend a moment confessing. Lord, I act in my life as though I bring something really important to the table that I can earn. There might be people in this room who have said, I've never actually put my trust and my faith in that kind of grace. What I've put my faith and my trust in is a two-way street. God gives, I give. We might need to take a moment and just let God through his spirit say, my grace is sufficient. It's enough. It's enough. Friends, what I don't want you to hear me saying is that then we just live our life haphazardly. But we live our lives out of that grace rather than thinking that we need to earn something. So is that place for a minute. Can we just settle our hearts? Can we close our eyes? If you want to stand, stand. If you want to sit, sit. If you want to kneel, kneel. I'm just going to give us a moment to just let God, through the power of His Spirit, remind us that His grace is sufficient. He has taken the initiative. He has made a promise. Let's just take a moment.